since, you know, the early 80s. Fias went on, I think, the 86 tour backing up Mraz, right? Yes. And he was, with that keyboard, and you have a backup keyboard player, he's way off to the side, right? Um, no, he's not way off to the side. He's, he's on that side of the stage, yeah. All right, and then... He's equal. You added the uh, singing, dancing ladies at some point to the show, right? The backup singers, yes. Right. When was that? 86. And then the second drummer was added when? Um, 91. And none of them are on the album cover or on the, the tour one sheet, right? No, they're in the program. Pictures and in the program. They're in the program as backup people, right? Yeah. Yet when Patrick was in the programs, he was mm -hmm. always one of the five Moody Blues, right? He was represented on the pictures with us, yeah. And there was, and each person would get his own <coughs> picture and then his own page of biographical material, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you don't do that for, I mean, there were, and then there were four, is mm -hmm. what has happened now, right? Well, the question is, when was yeah. the when was the decision made to have four Moody Blues? There's been four Moody Blues since Mike Pinder left. Except for programs that are given out to the audience and album covers, there's five, right? Except for programs and album covers, you see a picture where there's five, <coughs> yes. I notice on the Keys of the Kingdom program, there's no mention whatsoever of Moraz in the history of the group. Uh, do you know why that happened? No. I mean, in the Keys of the Kingdom program. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's, it's like Moraz never existed. No, the Keys of the the only dialogue in the uh, Keys of the Kingdom program, as far as I know, is about the Days of Future Past because we were celebrating the 25th anniversary of Days of Future Past. <laughs> Patrick had nothing to do with all our early hits. Well, the uh, isn't it true that the uh, the uh, publicity release that came out with respect to the Keys of the Kingdom mm -hmm. it makes no mention whatsoever of Moraz. I don't know. Were you at all involved in that? In the press release for the Keys of the Kingdom? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I didn't catch the answer. No? I don't know. Uh, and in fact, the fan club, the last fan club, the Moody Blues have their own fan club, right? Yeah. Isn't it true that on the cover of the new latest fan club sheet, mm -hmm. Moraz has been cropped out of the photo, so there's just four Moody Blues, where there once were five in the original photo, right? I don't know. I don't know what photograph you're talking about. Is there a conscious effort underway now to uh, erase Moraz from the history of the Moody Blues? I don't think so. What have you done, if anything, mm -hmm. to discuss the contribution and the contribution that Moraz made to the Moody Blues since he left the group? Well, I was prepared to always see it with, you know, with affection and um, until a great big lawsuit landed on my doorstep, you know, so I mean it rather changed the way I thought about it, I must say. Well, up until that affection, what did you do? I mean, up until that lawsuit, which was filed, I don't know, November, I think, of 91. September. All right. What did, what did you do between uh, March 91 and September 91? Work with the Moody Blues on the, and getting stuff together. And on the several times that you've been asked to comment about Moraz, what have you said? Uh, it hasn't been several times. How many times has it? I don't know, a couple. People have said, what, what's he doing? And I said, well, he's doing, yeah, I said he was doing um, movie work and stuff like he, you know, doing movie work in Los Angeles.
Why didn't you say what the truth was, which was we fired him or we let him go or we didn't want to work with him anymore because we thought his music sucked? That's not the truth. Well, that's what you've just been saying. I wouldn't last. say it the same as you. Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use those words. And nobody asked me. I was prepared to just say what I felt about it. He was in Los Angeles making movies. Line 81291. Remember appearing on that? You and John Lodge, Bob Coburn again. Mm, I, I don't know. Here was the question yeah. from, from a caller. What I wanted to ask you was about the status of Patrick Moraz. I understand that he may have left the band, and I was just wondering if that's true, and if so, why and who's replaced him? Justin Hayward, Stutter Stammer. Well, Patrick's not with us on the road anymore. Patrick was much more of a road member than he was a recording kind of member of the band, mm -hmm. and he moved I'm to Los. Actually, you can't read the things that aren't in evidence. I'm sorry. I don't think you should read. Which, which exhibit? Which exhibit is this? Um, okay. Dan, do you know the exhibit number? Is? Uh, it's the, uh, While there's a brief pause in the proceedings, Marty, let me ask you a question about this, where we're going with this, because it seems to be, he's talking about wrongful termination. I, you know, that, I'm hearing that. What about you? What do you think? I, I agree with you completely, Carol. Um, uh, in the complaint, which sets out the various uh, claims which have been asserted by uh, the plaintiff against the defendants, um, one of their claims is, is conspiracy to commit a wrongful termination, and the judge is sending that uh, to the jury, at least so far, it's in the case. Mm -hmm. And and I think that you're right that his, his questioning does uh, go to those issues as well as to uh, perhaps the issue of uh, the oral contract. What does he have to prove in wrongful termination? What, what are the elements there? Well, he, what he has to show is an, is an indefinite uh, period of employment uh, with a general understanding that uh, there would be a, an adverse change in circumstances before the termination would be, bef before there would be an act of termination. And that the uh, termination occurred uh, uh, in bad faith. So if, I, if someone says, as Justin said, and then contradicted himself, uh, he didn't sound good, then he seems to, uh, I mean, that would be cause, right? Well, if he didn't sound good and he's a member of a band, certainly that would be cause. Let's go right back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Your Honor, we'll withdraw the Very well. motion. All right, I'm going to read it again, your answer. Patrick mm -hmm. is not with us on the road anymore. Patrick mm -hmm. was much more of a road member than he was a recording kind of member of the band, and he moved to Los Angeles, I suppose, about two years ago. And he started doing a lot more movie work, and I think he really wanted to concentrate on that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we have a saying in England, once you've got your foot in the door, you know, you should try and keep it there. I think it's like that with soundtrack things, and we respect his desire to do that. Remember mm -hmm. saying that? Sounds like my, yeah. Well, it sounds like me. Was that really fair to say that Patrick was a more a road member than a recording kind of member? I think in the last three albums that's certainly true, yes. And that's because you and John Lodge made a conscious attempt that you were going to ease Mraz out, right? No. Weren't you dealing with pro... When you hired Visconti for... Was it, uh... In 90, what was the... Yeah, that was, yeah, that was uh... The Keys of the Kingdom record. You were having your Martin Wyatt, your assistant. He's not my assistant. What is he? He used to administer, administer some of my copyrights. Well, he was dealing directly with the engagement of programmers, wasn't he? Oh, he was working for Tom Hewlett at that time, yeah. And you were talking about hiring other programmers, not Moraz. Uh, no, he never hired a, a programmer. 
I had a keyboard player. All right, a keyboard player. You were consciously attempting to not utilize Miraz on Keys of the Kingdom. With a, what? You were consciously attempting not to use Miraz on the Keys of the Kingdom record, right? Uh, yeah, we wanted to use other people. We wanted to use Bias and Paul Blish. And by doing so, you didn't have to pay them any royalties, right? We just wanted to work with them. I don't know what the deal was. Well, did, was money a factor? No. No. If well, Patrick's contribution had been brilliant, that would have been absolutely wonderful in my book. Patrick's uh, made a major contribution to your last hit, your Wildest Dreams, didn't he? He played on Wildest Dreams, yeah. Yeah, and he played real good, didn't he? He played on it. Well, you hate what he did? No, he played... He played well on it. Well, Wax enthusiastic about the contribution that he made. Well, we all made a good contribution. I wouldn't wax enthusiastic about anybody's contribution. I would expect them to give of their best. So, all like we can... The, I'd expect them to do that. So you're like the English Jack Webb, just the facts man, I demand excellence, right? I don't know who Jack Webb is. <laughs> That'll teach you don't ask anybody about Dragnet if they haven't <laughs> seen this program yet. <laughs> What about his performance there, if you will, or his testimony on uh, Justin Hayward? How would you kind of rate him as a witness? Uh, has he done all the things that... Uh... Well, I think he's been a reasonably good witness for his own side. Um, I think that uh, uh, the most effective thing that the uh, plaintiff has accomplished here uh, is that he's uh, set out for the court and the jury, and indeed for us, uh, what this case is all about. This is clearly going to be a credibility case. Uh, he's uh, put the opposing witnesses on the stand, and, uh, and he's going to try and uh, dismantle them and demonstrate that their story is not the truth. Mm -hmm. and then he's going to put his own client on the stand, and I think everybody who comes and hear, uh, uh, turns on their sets tomorrow will hear uh, the plaintiff testify and then they'll judge uh, together with the jury who they believe. We're still kind of debating the wisdom, if you will, of this particular strategy. Let's just say, do a hypothetical. If you started down a road, let's say you, the litigator, and you find out that you're not getting what you want or you're not heading in the direction you want, would you continue down that road? Would, uh... Well, you want to withdraw gracefully, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, I suppose sometimes it is possible to uh, uh, change course uh, midstream. Uh, uh, Certainly, for example, here, if uh, uh, Mr. Johnson had intended to call all four of the Moody Blues uh, performers, all of the defendants, uh, he might change his, uh, uh, his plans at the present time and uh, move on to his own client. Well, not only the performers, but the manager, too. We'll take a break That's and come right, right back. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. We are now into day three of the case of Morass versus the Moody Blues, and we have Mr. Tom Hewlett on the stand. He is the manager of the group. He is the one actually responsible for the firing of Mr. Morass. Let's hear that testimony now. Graz and I had a meeting with you in your office. Uh, or excuse me, we had a meeting with you in Century City in, uh, in the late 80s. Do you remember? Yes, I do. Remember when that was? No, pr probably around 84 to 86, I believe, in that area. You remember where it was? It was at a deli uh, next to the Chinese restaurant in Century City in the restaurant row there. And Patrick Mraz introduced me to you at that meeting as his attorney and representative, right? Correct. And you told me at that meeting, didn't you, that the Moody Blues hated each other. I don't recall that. And you told me that if they could, John and Justin would love to get rid of Ray and Graham and Patrick, right? No, that's testimony rather than questions by the person who was there. I don't recall that. Just, just, just I'm sorry. I mean, he's testifying to this jury without being sworn as to what he said at the meeting. I'm asking leading questions. Objections overruled. I don't recall that. And you told me that, and Patrick, that Justin Hayward would walk over his own grandmother <coughs> to get his own way, didn't you? I don't recall that. 
And you told Patrick, and Patrick said, why aren't, I want my 20% that I've always been promised on the records. Do you remember that? I recall you and Patrick having a meeting with me, <laughs> making some demands, and I remember myself saying to you guys, you better cool it at some point in your life because this can all go away. Meaning that Patrick was not a member of the Moody Blues and it was a continuation of every time, not every time, it was a continuation of a continuous uh, request by Patrick every time we were doing any kind of business of coming up with another demand which I had to in turn carry to the band. In fact, many times you carried demands to the band, several times anyway, in which Correct. Mraz said he wants, Mraz wants his 20%. Correct. Tell me now, you're on the stand, on the pecking order of who's the best musician to the worst. Where does Mraz fit? Is he at the bottom behind someone or is he the best I don't, musician? I couldn't gauge musicians. That's not what I do. I don't consider myself to be an artistic uh, person. <coughs> Explain, please, how you interact in conducting the business affairs of the group. Who do you interact with primarily? Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Wynn Mather, Nicholas Brown, Tony Russell. Tony Russell is? the Moody Blues' current attorney in London. And your predominant responsibility is mostly, would it be accurate to say, mostly on the touring side? If that's what we're doing that month. If we're releasing a record, then my responsibility during that period is to coordinate on behalf of the band, because they're signed to an American record company, even though they live in England to work with the record company, which is in New York and Los Angeles. And you will agree, I believe, that while Patrick was with the Moody Blues on records and touring, he paid an equal percentage along with the other members, except perhaps a lesser percentage on records? I don't know. Of your, of your management royalty? I do not know. Because your deal was with, what, Threshold and Talent Corps or Rock on Tours or whatever? You don't know what... Repeat Patrick, the question. Do you know what, if anything, Patrick contributed towards your management commissions? No, I don't. You managed the Moody Blues, right? Correct. Were there, when you managed them while Patrick was with the Moody Blues, did you manage five people or four people or what? Well, I managed the way my... I guess what I need to do is try to explain what a manager is. All right, go it's ahead. It's okay. Um, different managers do different things. The way I managed and the way I grew up learning management, and I was very fortunate to work with the best, from Peter Grant, who started Led Zeppelin, to Colonel Tom Parker with Elvis Presley, to Jerry Weintraub with John Denver and Neil Diamond, and the Moody Blues. So I probably worked with uh, Roger Forrester with Eric Clapton, Robert Stigwood with the Bee Gees. You've been around. No problem. No, I was able to learn from a lot of people. I chose the way to manage would be to manage the, the name artist and not the individuals because in a band, nobody is equal. And there are, if, if you try to manage individuals, you as a manager, in my opinion, can only lose. So I do not manage any individuals in the Moody Blues. I help them. If they call me, I could give them some advice, but I'm not their managers. I think that's a very interesting uh, view to, to handle it. I, I'm, I want to now question you on how you do your, do your role as a fiduciary. Carl, Carl strike that last comment. Please restrict uh, the comments to questions. All right. You say you don't treat all, all of them equally, right? You don't treat everybody in the band equally? Well, musically, you can't. How about their intra-band relationships? Do you treat them all equally, or, or do you well, treat some unequally? 
a band is made up of, it could be nine individuals in a group like Chicago, it could be three individuals in a group like uh, um, or whoever, uh, Wilson Phillips. Uh, in a group, some members step forward and take on the business aspects of that band. Some members wish not to. They trust their partners. So I, I never end up working with an entire band. I usually end up working with the, a part of the band with their office. What, what do you view your... All right, that's a, just a portion of that testimony with Mr. Tom Hewlett, the manager of the band. Again, it looks like he's going down that road, Marty, about that smoking gun and, and other elements that he has to prove, too. Breach of fiduciary duty. Are we hearing that? Hearing? Yes, I'm beginning to hear a bit of that. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that's what the plaintiff's trying to prove. Uh, what he's uh, trying to establish is that uh, close personal relationship, the relationship of faith and trust. Uh, which is a special kind of a contractual relationship which is necessary for the plaintiff to establish in order to establish that there was that a, there was a breach of such a duty. Mm -hmm. So we're hearing a little bit of this when he talks about the relationship that's going on between the parties or did exist between the parties. Yes. Now, now uh, uh, it's not automatic for a manager of a rock group to have a fiduciary relationship with the members of the group but it would be commonplace. And I think we're hearing a little bit of that coming out of Mr. Hewlett's mouth at this present time. Yes, and I would expect that the, uh, that the uh, predominant evidence in this case will establish that there was such a fiduciary relationship. However, whether or not it's breached, I don't know. Marty, I want to thank you so much for making my evening so enjoyable as well as informative. And that concludes our coverage for the day of the civil suit by Patrick Moraz. We'll be showing you this trial throughout the week at this time, ending Friday night with a verdict. Tomorrow, our coverage will feature the testimony by the man bringing the suit. Patrick Morantz begins at the beginning. Under direct examination by his own attorney, Morantz describes his very first audition with the Moody Blues more than 15 years ago. And then we finally uh, went down, we tuned up with each other, we played the blues for a few minutes, you know, just to warm up. And, uh, you know, as, a, as a, a sound check would take place in any kind of studio, or any kind of playing situation. And then we played, uh, we decided on playing Tuesday Afternoon, which was a, um, a song written by Justin. Did you know the Moody Blues repertoire? Yes. At that time, yes, I had done my homework. I'd worked out uh, most of the, the music which we had eventually talked about with uh, Graham, and I had listened to the Octave album. I was familiar with the new material. I was familiar with the big uh, hits like Nights in White Satin, Tuesday Afternoon. And I knew that Ray had um, a big number in Legend of the Mind, which uh, you know, had been also um, recorded live in an album called... Once again, I want to thank Martin Gold, and you'll also have a chance uh, tomorrow, as I stated, to hear Mr. Moraz as, as well as his manager give his concluding remarks and his testimony. We will resume our coverage of Moraz versus the Moody Blues tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. For now, this is Carol Randolph. Thanks for joining me on Court TV tonight. Have a good evening. by both the plaintiff and the defense. The attorney for Patrick Moraz then started calling witnesses to the stand. First to testify was Ray Thomas, the flutist and a singer with the Moody Blues. He basically stated he knew little about the firing of Patrick Moraz and left the business of the band to others. Next on the stand, Justin Hayward. He's probably the most well-known member of the group. Hayward, who played the guitar, was the lead voice on the hit song, Nights in White Satin. He was asked why Moraz was fired and gave this answer. He wasn't playing the parts anymore. It didn't sound good. Is that it? I, I felt he'd lost interest. It didn't sound good. He was playing out of tune. And I don't think he was interested anymore. It wasn't a good, it wasn't a good relationship anymore. Now, Bridge. I can promise you that if it had have been good for the Moody Blues, it, Patrick Mraz would still have been playing for the Moody Blues. You mean if he had stopped asking for a raise? No, if the whole thing had been good for the Moody Blues. 
Our guest commentator this afternoon is Mark Jacobson. He's an entertainment lawyer in New York City. He's been practicing for nearly 15 years. He's the founder and chairman of the New York State Bar Association section on entertainment, arts, and sports law. Welcome back. Mark, you know, one thing that we haven't mentioned a great deal is the fact that Patrick Moraz signed a statement, or rather an agreement, a declaration, I guess you'd call it, with the Moody Blues at one point where he acknowledged that the professional name that the Moody Blues were used, that he had no part in that name, no interest in that name, he wasn't going to use that name in the future. And in that agreement, they talk about the other members of the band as being the Moody Blues. Now, he says that um, he was under duress when he signed that, and he wants to rescind it. But how damaging is that kind of a statement signed? I don't think it's particularly damaging. Just from reading it alone, uh, without knowing all the circumstances, you can't really tell. But it says, um, th these gentlemen are presently the Moody Blues. And certainly, they're saying to him, you'll sign this, and you'll become a member of the Moody Blues. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing intrinsically wrong in this. I think the focus of this document really is on the name and it's very often the subject of litigation in the music industry. He's claiming there was an oral agreement in this case. What did, does he have to do to prove an oral agreement? He'll have his testimony, we assume, and does he need one other person? Does he need circumstances that would seem to evidence an oral agreement? What does he need? As a matter of trial law, he just needs to convince the trier of fact with whatever he's got, whether it's not, there's no particular requirement that he uh, have objective evidence from a third party. If he gets up on the stand alone and they believe him, that's sufficient. Even if all the other members of the band say no? If Yeah, because someone's going to be believed. It's a question of fact, whether the agreement existed or not. Well, we're going to go now into testimony. And the first person that we're going to show you tonight on the stand is Tom Hewlett. And he is the manager of the band, and there are certain allegations that Moraz makes that after he was dismissed from the band that that Hewlett agreed that he was going to help him get more jobs. So there are a couple of elements that we're going to see in this direct examination by the, by the attorney for Patrick Moraz. Moraz and I had a meeting with you in your office. Uh, or excuse me, we had a meeting with you in Century City in, uh, in the late 80s. Do you remember? Yes, I do. Remember when that was? No. Probably around 84 to 86, I believe, in that area. You remember where it was? It was at a deli uh, next to the Chinese restaurant in Century City in the restaurant row there. And Patrick Moraz introduced me to you at that meeting as his attorney and representative, right? Correct. And you told me at that meeting, didn't you, that the Moody Blues hated each other. I don't recall that. And you told me that if they could, John and Justin would love to get rid of Ray and Graham and Patrick, right? No, that's testimony rather than questions by the person who was there. I don't recall that. Just, excuse me, I'm sorry. I mean, he's testifying to this jury without being sworn as to what he said at the meeting. I'm asking leading questions. Objections over. I don't recall that. And you told me that and Patrick, that Justin Hayward would walk over his own grandmother <coughs> to get his own way, didn't you? I don't recall that. And you told Patrick, and Patrick said, why aren't, I want my 20% that I've always been promised on the records. Do you remember that? I recall you and Patrick having a meeting with me, making some demands, and I remember myself saying to you guys, you better cool it at some point in your life because this can all go away. Meaning that Patrick was not a member of the Moody Blues and it was a continuation of every time, not every time, it was a continuation of a continuous uh, request by Patrick every time we were doing any kind of business of coming up with another demand which I had to in turn carry to the band. In fact, many times you carried demands to the band, several times anyway, in which Correct. Moraz said he wants, Moraz wants his 20%. Correct. Tell me now, you're on the stand, on the pecking order of who's the best musician to the worst. Where does Moraz fit? Is he at the bottom behind 
someone, or is he the I best musician? I couldn't gauge musicians. That's not what I do. I don't can. You know, the early 80s. Fias went on, I think, the 86 tour backing up Mraz, right? Yes. And he was that keyboard, and you have a backup keyboard player. He's way off to the side, right? Um, no, he's not way off to the side. He's he's on that side of the stage, yeah. All right, and then... He's equal. You added the uh, singing, dancing ladies at some point to the show, right? The backup singers, yes. Right. When was that? 86. And then the second drummer was added when? Um, 91. And none of them are on the album cover or on the, the tour one sheet, right? No, they're in the program. The pictures and in the program. They're in the program as backup people, right? Yeah. Yet when Patrick was in the programs, he was mm. always one of the five Moody Blues, right? He was represented on the pictures with us, yeah. And there was, and each person would get his own <coughs> picture and then his own page of biographical material. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But you don't do that for, I mean, there were, and then there were four, is mm -hmm. what has happened now, right? Well, the question is, when was, yeah. the, when was the decision made to have four Moody Blues? There's been four Moody Blues since Mike Pinder. <laughs> Except for programs that are given out to the audience and album covers, there's five, right? Except for programs and album covers, you see a picture where there's <coughs> five, yes. I notice on the Keys of the Kingdom program, there's no mention whatsoever of Moraz in the history of the group. Uh, do you know why that happened? No. I mean, in the Keys of the Kingdom program. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's, it's like Moraz never existed. No, the keys of the the only dialogue in the uh, keys of the kingdom program, as far as I know, is about. And John Lodge made a conscious attempt that you were going to ease Moraz out, right? No. Weren't you dealing with pro? When you hired Viscani for, was it uh, in ninety? What was the, yeah? That was yeah. That was uh, the keys of the kingdom record. You were having your Martin Wyatt, your assistant. He's not my assistant. What is he? He used to administer, administer some of my copyrights. Well, he was dealing directly with the engagement of programmers, wasn't he? Oh, he was working for Tom Hewlett at that time, yeah. And you were talking about hiring other programmers, not Moraz. Uh, no, he would never hire a, a programmer. I had a keyboard player. All right, a keyboard player. You were consciously attempting to not utilize Moraz on Keys of the Kingdom. We were, what? You were consciously attempting not to use Moraz on the Keys of the Kingdom record, right? Uh, yeah, we wanted to use other people. We wanted to use Bias and Paul Blish. And by doing so, you didn't have to pay them any royalties, right? We just wanted to work with them. I don't know what the deal was. Well, did, was money a factor? No. No. If well, Patrick's you... contribution had been brilliant, that would have been absolutely wonderful in my book. Patrick's uh, made a major contribution to your last hit, your Wildest Dreams, didn't he? He played on Wildest Dreams, yeah. Yeah, and he played real good, didn't he? He played on it. Well, you hate what he did? No, he played... He played well on it. Well, Wax enthusiastic about the contribution that he made. Well, we all made a good contribution. I wouldn't wax enthusiastic about anybody's contribution. I would expect them to give of their best. So, all like we could... I would expect them to do that. So you're like the English Jack Webb, just the facts man, I demand excellence, right? I don't know who Jack Webb is. <laughs> That'll teach you. Don't ask anybody about Dragnet about this, where we're going with this, because it seems to be... He's talking about wrongful termination. I, you know, that, I'm hearing that. What about you? What do you think? I, I agree with you completely, Carol. Um, uh, in the complaint, which sets out the various uh, claims which have been asserted by uh, the plaintiff against the defendants, 
um, one of their claims is, is conspiracy to commit a wrongful termination. And the judge is sending that uh, to the jury, at least so far it's in the case. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that you're right that this, his questioning does uh, go to those issues as well as to uh, perhaps the issue of uh, the oral contract. What does he have to prove in wrongful termination? What, what are the elements there? Well, he, what he has to show is an, is an indefinite uh, period of employment uh, with a general understanding that uh, there would be a, an adverse change in circumstances before the termination would be, before there would be an act of termination. And that the uh, termination occurred uh, uh, in bad faith. So if, I, if someone says, as Justin said, and then contradicted himself, uh, he didn't sound good, then he seems good. I mean, that would be cause, right? Well, if he didn't sound good and he's a member of a band, certainly that would be cause. Let's go right back. <laughs> All right, Your Honor, we'll, we'll withdraw the Very well. All right, I'm going to read it again, your answer. Patrick mm -hmm. is not with us on the road anymore. Patrick mm -hmm. was much more of a road member than he was a recording kind of member of the band, and he moved to Los Angeles, I suppose, about two years ago. And he started doing a lot more movie work, and I think he really wanted to concentrate on that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we have a saying in England, once you've got your foot in the door, you know, you should try and keep it there. I think it's like that with soundtrack things, and we respect his desire to do that. Remember mm -hmm. saying that? Sounds like my... Yeah. Well, it sounds like me. Was that really fair to say that Patrick was a more a road member than a recording kind of member? I think in the last three albums that's certainly true, yes. And that's because you... The Days of Future Past, because we were celebrating the 25th anniversary of Days of Future Past. Patrick had nothing to do with all our early hits. Well, the... Uh, isn't it true that the... Uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't the uh, publicity release that came out with respect to the Keys of the Kingdom mm -hmm. it makes no mention whatsoever of Moraz. I don't know. Were you at all involved in that? In the press release for the Keys of the Kingdom? Yes. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I didn't catch the answer. No? I don't know. Uh, and in fact, the fan club, the last fan club, the Moody Blues have their own fan club, right? Yeah. Isn't it true that on the cover of the new latest fan club sheet, mm -hmm. Moraz has been cropped out of the photo? So there's just four Moody Blues, where there once were five in the original photo, right? I don't know. I don't know what photograph you're talking about. Is there a conscious effort underway now to uh, erase? Moraz from the history of the Moody Blues? I don't think so. What have you done, if anything, mm -hmm. to discuss the contribution and the contribution that Moraz made to the Moody Blues since he left the group? Well, I was prepared to always see it with, you know, with affection and um, until the great big lawsuit landed on my doorstep. You know, so, I mean, it's rather changed the way I thought about it, I must say. Well, up until that affection, what did you do? I mean, up until that lawsuit, which was <coughs> filed, I don't know, November, I think, of 91. September. All right. What did, what did you do between uh, March 91 and September 91? Work with the Moody Blues on the... on getting stuff together. And on the several times that you've been a asked to comment about Moraz, what have you said? Uh, it hasn't been several times. How many times has it? I don't know, a couple. People have said, what, what's he doing? And I said, well, he's doing, yeah, I said he was doing um, movie work and stuff like he, you know, doing movie work in Los Angeles. Why didn't you say what the truth was, which was, we fired him, or we let him go, or we didn't want to work with him anymore, because we thought his music sucked? That's not the truth. Well, that's what you've just been saying. I wouldn't last. say it the same as you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use those words. And nobody asked me. 
I was prepared to just say what I felt about it. He was in Los Angeles making movies. Line 81291. Remember appearing on that? You and John Lodge? Bob Colburn again? Mm, I, I don't know. Here was the question yeah. from, from a caller. What I wanted to ask you was about the status of Patrick Moraz. I understand that he may have left the band, and I was just wondering if that's true, and if so, why and who's replaced him? Justin Hayward, Stutter Stammer. Well, Patrick's not with us on the road anymore. Patrick was much more of a road member than he was a recording kind of member of the band, mm -hmm. and he moved I'm to Los. You can't read the things that aren't in evidence. I'm sorry. You say, I don't think you should be reading. Which exhibit? Which exhibit is this? Um, and you know the exhibit number is. It's Well, there's a brief pause in the proceedings. Marty, let me ask you a question about...